So anyway, so the diamond uses delegate call and it, and it, and it delegate calls not to one contract, but potentially others. And uh, so anyway, so I think that's part of it. And then it's, you know, so it's as part of this, this, this early uh, opinion or advice that's given out to the community, you think delegate call is dangerous and don't use it and that kind of thing, but which is really not true. It's just, it's just you know how to use it, you need to understand it and then you can use it, you can use it right. So um, so there's that aspect. There's uh, on the trail of bits. Like yeah, I mean like I feel like when say link to the trail of bits, it, it article it, it it makes me wonder how much actual uh, research or due diligence they wrote. Because if they looked, if they you know they looked at that the trail of bits article, I mean it's it, it's it's an out of date article, you know referencing code and and aspects of the code that doesn't exist uh, in in diamonds. So. It's and there was, you know, things in that are I goes over the trail. So, you know, so, so they can consider, you know, using that as a reference how much time they spend themselves, actually, like, in the time to do for themselves. And that's really what I, I recommend to people like, if they're wondering, well, should I use a diamond or should I don't think that anyone, you know, I mean, if you're going to build the, the core of your product for your project, you know, the technical opinions that you should be listening to are your own technical opinions, your own preferences, what you find to be true. And and that's the done. Yeah, researching, see what other people say, but also trying some things out yourself, you know, implement a, a small version of your project, proof of concepts. There's another approach. Like, really, how does this other process kind of work? And you find what works for you, what you find to be true, and form your own opinion that's based on your own, you know, seeing what works and how things are. Um, because you can really be like, straight if you just follow what people say. Like, really in making some contracts work, it's really about understanding your code, how it works, and what's doing. The more you understand your code, what's doing, the, you know, the less bugs you'll have, less security issues, you'll feel happy because you know what you're doing. Uh, uh, this question, and this is what yeah. I was kind of hoping to see. Uh, Again, it's very weird, right? Because just one second, you know, when you the diamond thing, you have to look at the cultural context because it, unlike any other technology, is bizarre. Like they come and they say, over the past weeks, right? So they spent weeks on this, okay? And they should, because it's an important question. And then this is what they come up with. It's like, there's literally nothing here. And so, you know, what I was hoping to see was a comparison, right? Where it's like, okay, in tech, there's no such thing as good. There's no such thing as bad. It's just A compared to B, which is better. And so Things were a good, better, 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 and don't do that at all. Uh, here and I think as a shame because there's a valid you know, comparison to me because they are clearly also trying to get there. They're trying to get around the real life. Uh, the main design. So, you know, uh, what's the other approach? Is, you know, you can't do it without time, without delay. All you want to around uh, 24 limit for the upgrade ability. Uh, you want to get unlimited access, you can't do that without delay. All right. I'm just saying, without delegate, you can have, you know, a, an anyone's ever done in T, that's probably an experience this, right? You have one contract that mints the NFT and another contract that renders it, and you use call. You use, uh, um, you know, you say other contract, you know, renderer dot, you know, you know, construct token URI, whatever, you know, use a, a call to an external function, uh, an external contract. And so you can achieve unlimited flexibility, unlimited size by having uh, standalone deployed you know, normal contracts that have, uh, you know, interfaces that you can call into. And I think, I think that's what SAFE is saying they want to uh, do. And so I was wondering your perspective, like, you know, like that other method.
functionality. Like, how much do you inherit those stuff? Okay, yeah, you're right. You could have multiple separate contracts and each calls to each other and design systems that way. And, you know, that's versus using a die. And so, my comparison to that is that, uh, for the diamond, like, the too. And always in the diamond and diamond or not, always use diamond or I just know the diamond work and it's been it's been good and uh and it, it's had uh, some advantages over the multi the multi contracts and all so you can right now. So I mean one thing that I see is that with the diamond you you in the delegate call approach, okay, you've got your proxy and it can have an unlimited amount of faucets of functionality. And what that gives you is a single Ethereum address with smart contract functionality. And I found that to be advantage. So that means that if you want to have a user interface that talks to your system, you only need to give it one address and one ABI file. You know, the ABI file allows you to talk to the to the contract. So you just have one address. But if you have a multi-contract system, okay, now you have three, four, five addresses that you have to have. Well, no, so, your... Sorry, sorry, just just interrupt you for a moment. What, what I yeah. what I envision is is a case where you have one address and then that address calls another contract for you. So the user would hit the main NFT contract for token URI, okay, that one address, and then the main NFT contract, because the rendering logic is too big, uh, would call another contract and then get that result back to the main contract and give that result to the user. So I would, uh, to compare that, I'd be looking at that kind of uh, scenario. There'd be multiple contracts, but the user would only call the, the main one, and the main one would make set calls out to other contracts and return the result to the user. Got it. Yeah, so good. And so comparison on that, what I see on uh, diamonds is that when you when you call in when you call into the uh, no function on the diamond, it's really like that 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 call is part of the diamond, so it can access the diamonds, the, the storage in there. It can just execute its logic. I don't know, just directly and easily. But if you have okay, you've got your your contract. It's making an external call to another contract. One. You're, you you know you're you're making an external call okay so that that's a gas tip external calls are um, are expensive so there's two aspects there's complexity and there's gas so when you have that one contract making an external call to another contract okay you've got that um external call but then you also have so when, when this contract making a call to this other one you know does this other contract does it require like a uh, an authentication or permissions thing where it only allows your main contract to call into like in some functions, you know, it'll require authentication, something sensitive where you're making an external call. And so if you're, if your contract is making an external call that's sensitive, then that, uh, that other contract will have to authenticate that it's coming from your main contract. And so the authentication is, well, this is just authentication logic there. And it's also reading a state variable to say, to, to, to check is this, you know, is this address? And so you get, so you have the complexity cost of authentication and you have more gas costs because you're, you're reading, you're reading stuff there. So, I mean, there's, whereas a diamond, you know, you just call in, call the external function on the diamond and that function has access to the, to the state. There's no authentication. There's no extra, there's no authentication logic. There's no, uh, there's no uh, reading authentication state variable. So there's that aspect. There's another aspect of, so your 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 main contract makes an external call to this other contract. Now this other contract, you know, it, does it have to now make an external call to another contract? And if you you know if you're separating your contracts by functionality, or like this, you know, your main contract is an NFT contract, and you're you've got this other contract for staking or something, and you have another contract for voting. I'm just making it up. But if you're separating your functionality out by different contracts. And you're, you know, I don't know if you're, you're making multiple, my point is, is that you could be making multiple external um, contract calls for functionality. So you have this complexity of having to implement uh, different, you know, external functions for, for different things on different contracts and authentication between them and reading state between them. Whereas if, if that function, if you had a diamond and you just had a faucet for an NFT, you know, for the NFT functionality, you had a faucet for the voting, a faucet for the um, for staking, all in that one diamond, you just call, you know, those external functions that you call on it, it doesn't have to like do, um, you know, external calls to other contracts and simplify your logic and it's just access the state right yeah, I really like that because like what you're getting at is something a fascinating psychological contagion where people say, right, they say with their words, 
diamonds are complicated and diamonds have security issues. But what you just described, and I think it's very accurate, is the non diamond It's like, look, first of all, if you can get it all into one contract, then God, God, you know, bless you and do that. But if you can't, right, what you just described is the non-diamond way has a ton of complexity and a ton of security issues. And that does not... This is kind of fascinating how people make these safe uh, diamonds. An example, so example that I really like is uh, one of the biggest contract systems out there. There are a lot of contracts that are uh, being unfortunately under the diamonds that I have made. Like this is ENS, okay? And this is the base registrar, which means this is the NFT contract. This is an ERC721 contract. What you're looking at is a function. Uh, okay, don't pay too much attention to every single detail here, but this is a function that registers ENS domains. So if you own an ES domain, ENS domain, you're probably interested in this function, right? Uh, it's an internal function, but it's it's called by you know a couple other external functions. So this is basically an external function, you know, because they're you know one. And so what you'll see here is a bunch of stuff happens. Okay, there's minting, there's some burning, there's some confusing stuff with the sub main sub node. Fine. Uh, they built flexibility because they wanted other contracts. They wanted other stuff, you know, that they did be able to mint from. So, for example, you need to know how much it costs to register a domain, and that cost might change over time. And so, you need uh, this modularity. And so, what they do is they let controllers mint. Okay, so now you see only controller here. Okay, so this is the authentication. So now we scroll up, Diamonds. and we see only controller uh, is a modifier, and it requires that. Uh, this controller's thing, uh, hash uh, mapping, has the message sender. Okay, well, how does that get administered? Okay, now you have, over here, you have uh, add controller and remove controller. Okay, so that's how you manage the uh, ability, you know, who can mint, the contracts that can, can mint, and this is an only owner function. So now, you know, this is a lot of code that you're writing. This is managing stuff, add and remove controllers. Uh, you end up with uh, basically a registry. You end up with a registry of controllers who are permissioned, and that starts to look a lot like uh, the diamond registry, uh, but with added on top of it these explicit checks because of the um, uh, uh, the external call thing. And so, you know, the the idea here basically is if you want to create your own registry and deal with your own authentication because these are external calls then uh, do that. But what the diamond does is it just does that same thing for you. And so, you know, yes, it might be confusing in some ways because you have to think hard about delegate call. But for me personally, the number one thing you want to avoid, the number one most confusing thing is writing code. And so if you are writing code, like add controller, remove controller, uh, that's going to cause you a lot more problems than if you sit down and think. For, it's not easy to think about, by the way, but if you think about it and figure out the delegate call details, figure out how diamonds work, uh, that is less work than writing code to do things, uh, you know, the old, uh, uh, the old way. And, you know, here's a simpler example from my article. This is the rendering contract thing, right? Okay. Uh, what is this? You have to have this state variable to store it. You have to be able to set it. So this is a setter, right? There's no permissions here because this, this is a read-only thing, but you have to set this. So you have to be a function for this. And now you need to remember in token URI to call the renderer. So what is this? What are we looking at here? We're looking at a registry, which is here. And we are also looking at a mapping of functions and contracts that handle them, right? So in this case, we are looking at an informal mapping based on explicit function declaration that says, hey, uh, the handler for token URI is actually this renderer. Uh, but... Um, uh, you know, this could easily just be a facet uh, that 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 handles Tokyo Rai, and then you would not have to write out the function. So if you like writing code like this, then probably you don't like the diamond or whatever. Like this is the comparison. Write this or use the diamond or get it under 24 kilobytes. Under 24 kilobytes, probably not an option if you're doing something complicated. So do you like this code? You know, do you like this kind of code? Uh, that's the that's the question. And so what I would expect to see in an article that trashes the diamond standard, which is not for everyone in every circumstance, is a thing that compares this to that because you can't just call the diamond more complicated and less secure because those concepts don't exist. It's all in comparison to what. And if you're gonna call this super simple and uh, and more secure, uh, then you know, Good luck writing this kind of stuff. I've written this kind of stuff. Uh, it's more complicated. It's 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 more error prone. I don't want to write code. Uh, this is the the trade off you have to look at for the uh, 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 for the diamond. So anyone out there doing research, find big contract systems that don't use the diamond. 
ENS is my favorite example. It's a mess. Don't compare the diamond to simpler systems. You know, what is the complicated safe system that's being compared against? They don't say. So, you know, that's kind of my uh, uh, feeling on this thing. You got to do the apples to apples comparison. Well, yeah, I agree with that. And that goes along with what I've said and what I've told people is that what diamonds does is if, when you have a multi-contract system, it simplifies that. So because of the multi-contract system, just what you're talking about, you've got the, these external calls between things. You've got authentication. You have more reading of it. All, all of that complexity goes away with a diamond where, you know, each faucet is really like it's part of the same contract you might say it's, it's part of the same thing so you write each faucet as if it's you know as it's, it's as it's, it's it's a separate contract but it's part of the same contract it's part of the same diamond and so that just simplifies the function you know fun functionality yeah i mean i think another way of looking at it is like look if you're not going to use the diamond you are going to re-implement a version of the diamond you're going to re-implement the diamond because the diamond contains very basic concepts for multi-contract systems like a registry you know it's like you're going to re-implement it and you might want to, like that might be the thing that you're interested in, but you're not going to get around these core, uh, these core concepts. And so let me ask this question, you know, Nick, so, so I love the diamond. Uh, I know you invented it. You love the diamond. I've read a ton of your stuff uh, on it. Um, what, what practical exam, you know, I can tell people about my practical stuff or whatever. And I know you've, you know, done some stuff, both of us in gaming. I know there's a dark, great dark forest ETH, uh, post on the diamond, uh, which I will pull up here. This is one of the uh, great ones. Um, I encourage people to read it. What are some good live projects getting usage that employ the diamond standard and, you know, add and remove facets and, um, you know, are examples that people can look at and, and learn from? Yeah, sure. So I'm going to pull up awesome diamonds real quick uh, because that really has a list of things. But there's some there's some interesting things people are are building um there's both projects that people are um you As far as some interesting people building you know, diamond boundaries, I'm afraid I'm not able to that. We're just seeing package management for all trees and um, people building interface from, um, from um, uh, here, uh, from the Europe DAO. There's uh, some building um, energy concepts. Uh, so people read the code, right? It is ludicrous if you really think about it. Because take ERC 721A, right? Which I really like. Great stuff for minting, whatever. Like, you know, it ain't cheap. It's got a bunch of stuff in there, especially if you want to use the queryable extension. It's kind of insane, given the blockchain thing, people are redeploying this exact same code, exact same code again and again and again. That said, I have not seen, there's no facet out there that I know about, unless you, where's the facet out there that I can tap in and get ERC 721A functionality for my diamond for free? Does that exist? You know, it's um, it might have been deployed, but but I don't know, because, you know, that's really, again, what a, what a faucet Man, uh, faucet registry or our manager would do and, and i and i said there's these couple of projects so they might have they probably do have these two projects uh zero xpm and if they're in package manager they probably do have um faucets i don't know if they're deployed or not maybe they are deployed but that's like definitely like a feature that i've been expressing is like okay you know stop deploying your faucets you know just use the, the, the deployed faucets that are already on chain um or like you know 
do this kind of package management stuff for registry because you know it really hasn't been utilized but it's like no, there's no reason not to there's no reason not to do that um so yeah, yeah i think that would be huge, huge for yeah. the pr situation is if yeah. people could actually say okay i'm making an nft today okay uh i'm gonna write five lines of code i'm gonna use deploy fa fa facets and it's going to you know take uh you know, 10 minutes and way less. Like that would be an amazing, if anyone out there wants to write that blog post and deploy the fast and pay for it themselves, right? I don't know for it. I think that would be huge PR for what it's worth. I also want to go back to your question. I mean, one project I was looking at was recently is Nick and they are a um, like no code platform for uh, smart contracts. And they do allow someone to create their own NFT uh, contract. It's really a diamond with the NFT uh, faucet. And because their, their, their thought is, is that, you know, you might have an NFT contract and in the future there's more standards, there's more functionality and they wanted to provide their users with, okay, if you make your own, own NFT contract for your art or your, your thing or whatever it is, but then like, okay, you know, then, but, and, but Nifty Kit can then they can build additional faucets for, future functionality they really looked at it as a future proof thing so that you know then as things evolve and new ideas come they you know people's existing nft contracts can then be they can they can add a new functionality or they can you know if there's improvements to existing functionality how it works and just it can be replaced and of course you know you know it could be you know the user could then you know approve things you know depending on the project project set up things how they set and the dime doesn't enforce one security model on another there's upgrades but so anyway so that, I, that's one project that was interesting to me is nifty kit because they are they're really looking at using the diamond to future proof the nft contracts that they're you know letting their users create interesting yeah that's yeah. that's you know that's really cool i mean i think uh so um so let me, let, me, let me switching to the tech side actually, because it's something I wanted to ask you, something I've run into. So there's a question of code reuse, right, in the diamond. Like the beauty of the diamond is, uh, you know, makes this kind of thing simpler. Where, uh, you know, you're not, you, code reuse broadly speaking is simpler. You don't have to call to other contracts. But then, what if two facets want to use the same function? Right, and there's blogs about this, so you can read that. But basically, you know, one pattern, which I think is a cool pattern, is to write a facet that's internal functions, and then you uh, inherit that facet in multiple uh, normal facets. So you could have something called internal facet, which has a function called like you know add two numbers, and that's internal pure. And then you 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 say uh, you know facet A is internal facet, facet B is internal facet. And now they can both use the add two numbers. Uh, function. The other thing you can do is you can call uh, public functions in another facet by call, by calling yourself and letting the diamond thing uh, work as if you were a uh, an external caller. Now that, of course, has uh, extra gas and all the sort of issues with, with call we discussed uh, before. The internal thing is better. The internal thing, which is something I've found, is okay, now you have code that's internal, that, 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 that a bunch of facets inherit and it's using a bunch of, okay, now you want to change one function in the internal facet, okay? Uh, minor change, but boom, okay, now I have to redeploy, recompile my entire app because every single facet uh, inherits from this thing and that's at least how my version of, uh, you know, hard hat to play works, it, re it recompiles these things. So uh, I find that the best code reusage and the cleanest code reusage also uh, leads to a high cost of recompiling and redeploying, whereas the non-clean version, which is doing calls to myself,
do it. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about code reuse. Yeah, sure. So um, one, one method of creating on shack only with no functions and then creating that faucet so those faucets can be used. One other aspect about that, you know, this lead color, when you, when you compile a contract that's inheriting uh, into functions, it'll Hey, if the internal anything in the internal function which we should inherit from changes, or will it be smart? Maybe I'm just like an idiot compiler, but you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you could compile. I mean, there's a couple thoughts on that. One is that, um, like, yeah, let's say you have, you know, four faucets and they're inheriting the same internal functions, and one faucet, you want, you want, uh, one of the internal functions, uh, that you're inheriting to work a little bit differently. I mean, one option is to, uh, I don't necessarily recommend this, but it'd be considered. You know, you'd have to look at you know the pros and cons that just comes to my mind right at the moment. But you could override that internal function in this one faucet, so it works a little bit differently in this faucet, which you may not want to do because now you have an inconsistency between the different faucets. Um, so, but anyway, so that that is an option. You could override one of the internal functions in one of the faucets. Uh, another thing that comes to mind is is that you might have a diamond, and let's say you have three faucets and um, Okay, so and you, you actually deploy these three faucets and you um and you add them to your diamond and those faucets use an internal uh inherited contract with internal functions and now you want to you know add another faucet and you want to modify those internal functions you know for this faucet. Well, it doesn't mean you have to. It doesn't mean that you have to change the existing three faucets. You know, those can, if, if those are fine, you don't have to um, replace those, those the functions from those other three faucets. You can just make your change, your internal function, and deploy your new faucet with the change. You could do that. Uh, but again, if you're, you're using hard hat deploy, it might not let you do that. So that kind of depends on your tooling or your strategy on that. Um, so that, that's on that. Uh, what, one other thing is, is that another method of sharing code is not using internal functions and contracts. The it's uh, using it's using a Solidity library with internal functions, um, and and then importing and using the Solidity library, you know, in your in your faucets. Now, when you're using just internal functions and Solidity libraries, you're not separately deploying your Solidity. Library con people get confused on this. They think, well, if you have a Solidity library, then you have to deploy it. Well, that's not true. You only deploy a Solidity library its own separate thing if it has internal functions. If it only has internal functions, it's never deployed separately. It's just when you you know when you import a Solidity library into a contract or faucet and you use its internal functions, those internal functions from the Solidity library are compiled into that faucet, kind of like like inheriting it. Um, so, I mean, one aspect I like about using Solidity libraries this way is it's more, um, for me, it's more explicit because when you, when you import a Solidity library at the top of your file, you can say exactly what, well, you import your library and then in your faucet, you, you, you know, your, your internal function calls are prefixed with the name of your Solidity library. When you look at your code, you know exactly where your function is from in the Solidity library because it's prefixed with that Solidity library. Whereas if you're inheriting a contract with internal functions, you're just, you know, calling those internal functions and you look at your code, you don't necessarily know where those internal functions come from because they're not pre, so, you know, maybe you can prefix it. Um, I'm not sure on that, but anyways, I found that uh, using Solidity libraries are more, um, can be more um, explicit, but there's other, but the Solidity libraries, the tooling for it is less good as in using either either approach can be used. I think the tooling for inheriting internal functions is better. Um, th yeah, no, that makes sense. I just say what what and I use hard hat yeah. deploy. Like I'm a big believer in just like the dumbest thing, the simplest thing. You know, hard deploy scaffold, which is another project out there that uses hard hat deploy. You know, I think hard deploy is good for uh, you know if you're newer and whatever. Foundry is cooler. It's new. What I found, and I don't know why, uh, is that. All this stuff worked for me. I found situations where I didn't like how I was uh, being asked to recompile, redeploy, and recut facets, which to my eye hadn't changed, functionally speaking. Now, that's not like the end of the world if you do that because everything's fine. It's just like cost gas. You redeploy something, even if it's a small contract, it cost gas deploy, and then diamond cut, you diamond cut in 10 methods. So. You know, I think that would be a um, just something that I would personally continue to watch out for. I'd encourage people to 
watch out for because um you know uh yeah you don't want to like make you know spend more money than necessary i think i think uh evm ramen puts an interesting thing uh in the chat which is basically this question of uh storage and one very funny thing about diamonds and storage is that if you look at all upgradable contracts, you see this fascinating thing about storage where uh, you have to be careful with it. I'll let you explain why, you know, Nick, but then you look at all this stuff, uh, you have this warning, you look at the open Zeppelin upgradable contracts, and you see it is a bloodbath out there for how they recommend uh, handling uh, storage. It is, and I'm sorry, I love open Zeppelin, blah, blah, blah. unbelievably terrible what they are doing. Uh, and what they are encouraging people to do and to think about. And um, I'm in shock, but I'll let you explain because uh, you invented the right way to do it, Nick. Uh, sure. So I'll just say that, you know, the the analogy of um, hand storage, diamond storage is, I, I like to think of uh, namespaces in like Java, where, you know, you're going to import, you know, you're going you're gonna to use some, some code from another file and you have, you have namespaces to separate your out your code. And as long as you're using a good, unique namespace, you're not going to conflict with some other namespace. And so the same idea um, is used in, in, with, with diamond storage, this idea that you're going to store a struct at a, a particular location in contract storage. And where, where are you going to store it? Well, you could use uh, like a, a string namespace, you can use some other kind of way to determine. But you, know, the the point is, you just use a a, a unique, um, you 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 create you use some data and then you hash it, and you create this unique place to store your your data. And that's 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 fine. I mean, that's there's no, you know, as far as like storage class, I mean that that's fine. Use the you know the the Keka to hash it and you go oh well could if you you know hash it could it could it um conflict with something else then like no that's not something you need to worry about you have, i mean realize this the solidity mappings also use a hash to store values in that mapping so that so solidity itself you know and its mappings and in its arrays as well they're using the same mechanism that diamond storage is using to determine where to store a struct so if you say that that is not secure or could have conflicts. So well, you're just you're also saying that the solidity language itself is is insecure because it's just doing this. You're you're it's, with diamond storage. You're manually doing, you're manually determining or explicitly determining the storage of your struct. Whereas in solidity, it's doing it for you behind the scenes. It's hashing the information about the the key of your mapping um, and a storage slot position to determine where a value is so it's like you know it's doing the same thing so anyway so that aspect that brings up a lot of people go well you know could you have a storage conflict of you know where you're storing using using the storage it's like no the answer is no so and, and then and then just and so that's like i mean as long as you use a you know for so i don't i've never i've never seen or had a problem with 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 diamond storage and people bring it up because they don't understand it. They don't understand how solidity itself works and it's doing that behind the scenes. Um, and well, so I think let, that, let me just push yeah. on this a little more because I think what people need to understand is the alternative, the alternative that is recommended. And the alternative that's recommended is essentially so okay, so diamond storage means you you choose the 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 space that this thing goes, you choose the slot that the thing goes, you choose its address based on um a hash of a unique string. So it's just like out there in space. And you know it's not going to get touched by anything. The the normal way of doing storage in, in in Solidity, when you just write state variables in your contract, is it goes one by one. So it goes slot zero, slot one, slot two, slot three. And so you know you need to make sure that you don't uh, trample the slot of the previous uh, implement you know implementation or whatever it is. You need to make sure that you're in a unique slot, knowing that you're going sequentially, and that everyone who's using the storage thing is going sequentially. And so it creates a problem, right? And so the open Zeppelin method is basically just to deal with it just to say hey listen uh make sure you don't change the order that these things are physically written in your code since when does the order in, a, in code matter uh for something and you have to reserve gaps so if you go to my stream here you will see this is open zeppelin's uh code for one of their upgradable libraries called initializable and if you look at the bottom they have this you went 256, a 50 uh, element array uh, called 
uh, gap and the uh, uh, and it's and how many that's how you know you're getting like private right like there's the word private but then one two three four five six if you put six underscores before the variable you know it's private okay uh how did it come to six maybe i should do a pull request that puts 500 or 50 uh, underscores here that would be more private the idea here is so insanely dumb it's basically saying in order to reserve ourselves the ability to add more storage uh at, in this uh contract which you can inherit and to make sure this contract's additional storage won't uh, uh, trample um, your, at, your, 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 your contract storage, your application storage, we are going to put 50 blank slots in our thing. And that way, your app will always start at slot 51. And uh, uh, we don't have – okay, episode, yeah. So, you know, last year, it's like this is the stupidest thing in history. I will just honestly go on, on record saying that. And, um, you know, again, it's like, yes, diamond storage is confusing. Like, absolutely. You have to think about it and you have to learn it. But compared to what? That's the question technology. And if you want to compare it to slot based gap management, this is the most confusing thing imaginable because it requires you uh, to not just envision the way storage works uh, generally um, in terms of it having addresses, but to think about that in terms of the order in which lines are written on your screen and then who's before you and what they're writing and how many, how much gaps they, it's just, it's just, it's just crazy. It's crazy to have to manage a, uh, uh, an incremental list of um, storage things with, with gaps uh, uh, in it. So um, if you want to use an open Zeppelin upgradable contract, I urge you to reconsider that. Uh, and well, put a very fine point those things are not safe to use <laughs> you know what i mean like here's a good upgradable thing erc 721a upgradable like they just like open zeppelin are not a diamond thing they're just a regular upgradable thing but they use diamond storage because they are sane uh, this is crazy uh crazy 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 talk do not use open zeppelin's upgradable uh, uh, contracts for this reason so yeah i think diamond storage can be confusing you gotta learn it Sucks to have to learn things. I hate learning things. Uh, but compared to what? Compared to the worst thing ever, I prefer uh, something that's not the worst thing ever. So I'm a big fan of Diamond Storage. But I will put this question to you, uh, Nick, because, um, again, EVM Brahman raises this. Uh, they're basically saying um, there's another pattern in uh, smart contract storage stuff, which I think you like, which I actually don't like which I think is too far, which is this app storage thing where basically you, uh, well, anyway, maybe you can explain this, but where you, basically you do use the slot-based system, uh, but you only use the zero at slot, and this makes the code cleaner to look at, but maybe more confusing. Um, anyway, so what are, your, what are your reactions here, Nick? Hey, mind, yeah. mind if I just uh, quickly quickly jump in? Uh, I just want to pop off quickly on the last thought you had there, uh, Middle Marsh. Is, uh, yeah, you know, I, I agree. I think that just from you know going back to your original point about kind of like the psychology of what we're what we code uh, and the way that the space has developed an ethos it's a very ethos driven community which is great in a lot of ways I think an ethos that can shoot us in the foot sometime is this idea that uh, you know on chain your code needs to be uh, incredibly simplistic because you know long long logic takes up space uh, you know the EVM isn't optimized for storing things. Uh, but that shoots us in the foot when you see things like this, where it's this weird little hack to try and get around the fact that, like, look, that there are technical solutions that have been implemented for this type of thing for decades when you can look at traditional software, right? A hash map, a hash table, not that complicated. We just haven't really done it in Web3 before. And I agree that, you know, because diamond proxies, the app storage pattern, you're starting to get towards like new, using namespaces. And we're working with a low level machine here that we need to accept the fact that for, for the space to grow, for us to have NFTs with amazing functionality that delights our users, we need to allow for our code on chain to grow. And that means that we need to leverage the history of software development and algorithms when we write our code. And that, that's why like I've been tinkering with this idea of writing a standard uh, for like the app storage that sits on top of what uh, you know Mudgeon's written for Diamond is 
you know, and, and to, with your question uh, about kind of like Avgoti's implementation will follow up on is, we can have a standard for writing hash tables. It doesn't need to be specific to diamonds, right? It could even be used for something like this, where, hey, instead of having a, you know, a UN two fifty six array that's of length fifty, so that you ensure that you have more space for storage, why don't you just use a namespace that's on the back end using a hash table? Um, and so I think as developers in the space that are trying to push forward new standards and get us out of the rut of the original development in the space, which was awesome, but uh, that's kind of my opinion on it. It's like people need to get comfortable with implementing these more complex standards that we've used a lot in previous software development and putting them into a Web3 standard. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to add that um, Open Zeppelin, actually, the, the primary developer for Open Zeppelin has said in a couple places, and I have I have one of the places highlighted on my screen right now. He, he has said that uh, the next major version of Open Zeppelin, uh, they they want to use diamond storage. So they're, they're upgradable contracts for their upgradable stuff. So they, they are planning to, you know, use, you know, get rid of the gap um, thing there and and to use uh, diamond storage for, for upgraded contracts. So, you know, the, the diamond storage um, technique there really is, you know, it's coming to open Zeppelin. It's, it's the future of smart contract development. So it's just a matter of when, you know, when, when, when does the developer want to learn it or start using it? Yep. Then open Zeppelin is going to come back with their mirror.xyz post. You know, we've been getting a lot of requests to look at the diamond storage thing. And, you know, now that it's, you know, we decide, I kid, but I, I am not, uh, I'm not holding my uh, my brain. Here, here's a question. Just here's a trivia question. And diamond storage, I will go on. It is confusing. You have to think about it, right? But like, it's confusing because a you see assembly in your code, uh, and b there's this question of the data types in the struct. So I'm going to put a quiz. This is a quiz, not really a quiz. This is something I don't know. Okay, putting a struct in diamond storage, right? Putting a mapping in that struct is amazing because a mapping. You know, takes up no space. It's just like a pointer to some other thing. If I put a uh, integer or whatever, that's fine too. Here's my question for you, Nick. And just diamond storage. Uh, a diamond storage stored struct, and I put a variable length array of structs in it, and I then add a number to the top after that variable length array, or is that like bad? idea <laughs> what what's the deal with 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 that because i'll tell you what i did actually i i created a mapping of my own address to that variable length address just to have a mapping in the struct cuz i'm too scared but i don't know how, how does that how does that work yeah so so you can add new state variables to the end of structs that are used in, in diamond storage so you can do that now the thing the thing with um with with mappings uh is that they're not like you're right that you know in, in in contract storage you declare an integer you declare a an an address um, the these smaller data types um, they are stored sequentially in uh, storage but dynamic arrays are not so when you you define you know in your struct you Or it's not a story, but it's a random place you can just like the dinosaur itself. So that's why you don't have to worry about like you know, okay, you're using it, okay, you put a dynamic array in your truck. Okay, yeah, you can add other state variables after that and it'll be fine. And so a fixed length array though is not like that. No, then that that'll be that'll be sequential. But then, you know, you won't have a problem with the it'll be a fixed amount a fixed amount. So, you know, solidity will know you know. I mean, if the, if the dynamic array thing was stored sequentially, then it would be, a, you know, it would be a problem because you you can have a dynamic array. So, but that's that's why it's stored some some random location, so it can be added to something else and not in the middle of your struct. So, conceptually, dynamic array is the same as a mapping in that you are only getting a pointer to some random area that has all the stuff you want, and so dynamic yeah. arrays are just as safe as as mapping. Especially when you're thinking about putting them into a struct in dime storage. That's right. Yeah. 
yeah so it's yeah it's totally fine with mappings and dynamic arrays and your, and your structs for 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 diamond storage no yeah now incidentally what i would recommend to people who are trying to get started with this is just don't okay actually here's the thing with the internal thing suppose i want to add a member to a struct right now every at least the way i'm using the struct thing where i want to uh uh, now every single contract that includes this, every single facet that includes this struct will have to be redeployed, right? Okay. Even if they don't right. use the new member. So here's my answer to that. I really have two answers now. Uh, what's his name? Ronan, or we can the author of Harvard. I'm sure he's had this, this come up as an issue, as a problem. I mean, it might be working on a solution. I think the thing is to improve had deployed because of the reason. You know, like just said, you want to add uh, you, you know, you add a member. There's no reason to have to repile the other faucets and deploy them. And you know, if you, there's no reason to change them, there's no reason to um, deploy them. You know, compile and deploy external because you're at ten facets use the same struct, right? And now we add a member at the end of that struct. It's only relevant to one of the facets. Even so. They're all using that same struct, and now that struct has changed without, and I agree, hard had the ladies to improve, but conceptually even isn't, aren't all those 10 facets going to have to be redeployed since it's literally the same struct that was modified for each, even though they aren't using the new, even no, though all one aren't using the new member? No, that's what I'm saying. They do not need to be they do not. redeployed. No, they don't need to. Okay. Dope. Yeah, they don't need to. Um, that's, that's, yeah, that's fine. Yes, you know, you, you're you adding to the end of the struct, so that doesn't change the struct in, you know, in these other places. Um, in, in, so you, in, this one faucet that needs to be changed that, use the, the, that needs to use the new member, that's the only faucet that needs to be added or replaced. The other ones don't need to. Nope, yeah, I guess I use Foundry, all the cool kids use Foundry these days. Or hard hat. I mean, you can use hat without hard hat deploy. Um, use hard hat to foundry. You know, a lot of people like using foundry as well. So, yeah. And that's another area more tooling for like, more even going for diamonds and hard hat. I mean, that's a really good area to go. Um, you know, I think you know, hard hat deploy the nice on hard hat deploy basically for diamonds and handles all these aspects like, like what you're just talking about. Handles that handles everything well. It'd be really good. Yeah, I mean another big area that I've seen on this is that right now hard hat deploy, and I get it, it's simpler. It treats like you know, facet as all or nothing. And um you know, saying, Hey, I just wanna use you really get the diamond but it's often treated as like a an afterthought like deploy the facets and then okay cut everything in but in reality right you should be able to cut in hey just one function from this facet just one function from this other facet and so you know that's way more flexibility allowed for even than you know the facet registry imagine like the it's really the, the function registry right you can get any but i, I don't feel like uh, and i've seen custom scripts written i know you've written one for this i saw one in dark forest but i'm too nervous about any custom thing versus the uh, out of the box thing. And I know hard hat deploy says they're trying to work on this, but that would be another really dope thing to see with uh, with tools is that extra level of granularity, which, you know, the standard allows for. Totally, totally agree with you. Totally right. Yeah, you know, I, I wanna go back to this. I wanna mention something about that safe article they wrote. And one thing that, that struck me about it is, is they could have written an article that laid out their architecture for smart contract uh, accounts and you know and they did do they did lay out some you know how it works for them but it was just interesting to me that that they sort of had you know want, they went out of their way to say why they're not you i mean my thought is why even mention diamonds why even why say why you're, you're not using it? 